question, please um, click on the leftmost icon on the top ribbon, which has the person with the hand up. Um, I just uh, search a status to raise your hand. Um, to activate your microphone, please click on the gray microphone sign, choose your microphone and enable. But please, please, please note that we'll keep the microphones muted during the talk in order to prevent any background noise. And most importantly, at the end of the lecture, we'll open up a URL for a registration form to be completed. Please complete this form, especially if you have been selected to a shortlisted to attend the HG Bionet hands-on practical GWAS uh, workshop. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers in, this, in the lecture series, uh, Professor Hazelhurst. Professor Hazelhurst is a professor of bioinformatics at the University of Witwatersrand and a principal investigator of the HG Bionet with SNOD. Prof. Hazelhurst has been involved in developing a series of automated GWAS workflows on HPC environments and has provided a number of GWAS face-to-face -face training workshops. And we're extremely, extremely lucky to have him on board today, giving us the first of the seven lectures. So over to you, Scott. Thanks, Sumir. Can I just check that everyone can hear me? Does it sound good? Great. OK. So I can do a lot about the volume of my voice. Um, not much I can do about quality at this point, but I think everyone will, will manage. So thank you, Samir. So I'll be speaking about a lot of the work that's been done by H3O Bionet in the pipelines group over the last two or three years. And uh, we've been quite hard at work trying to develop tools for the H3A projects. And so welcome, everyone, to this first in the H3O Bionet series on genome-wide association studies. Uh, if I could just r ask everyone to mute their microphones, if you, um, unless you have a question to ask. It's uh, just a bit disruptive to me when there's feedback coming through. So in subsequent lectures, we're going to give an overview of GWAS, and we'll give you a theoretical insight into the what, the why, and the how of doing analysis. Uh, if I could again ask people to turn off your microphones, sir. Please turn off your microphones. There are about 10 people still with microphones on. Please, could you mute your microphones? Hi, Scott. Scott. Hello. Hi, uh, you broke off there for a minute. I'm um, looking at you. Okay. okay. Um, I think that someone tried to mute everyone else and they muted me as well. If I again, please could ask everyone to mute your microphone. Hi. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, Banja, I'm going to mute your microphone, so please keep it on mute while we continue the lecture. Okay, so let's get on with it. Uh, this is not an introductory course to, to GWAS, uh, so I'm not going to explain the details in great deal, detail, but just to recap what we're doing. As we all know, we all organisms, all humans, have two copies of a genome, one inherited from the mother and one from the father. And when we do a GWAS, we look at those positions where there's variability, and we call those positions um, a SNP. And we look to see at that position what variation there is, what alleles can be found. So perhaps at this position, there are two alleles, an A and a G. And so what we're interested in is, does this particular person have two copies of the A allele, or two copies of the G allele, or are they heterozygous and have both an A and a G allele? And we repeat that at millions of positions on the genome, and we discover what variability that individual has, and then we repeat that across thousands of individuals. And then what we're interested in is, is there a significant difference between people who have some disease, some condition, or on people who don't have that condition. Now, I'm not going to try to motivate why this is an important application area. The fact that we have so many people on this call and so many people who apply to do the course, I think everyone knows why GWAS is so important and what huge contributions have been made by GWAS analyses in understanding a whole range of diseases and conditions. And what I'm going to focus on is how we do GWASs. So, and in particular, I'm going to look at the computing requirements for doing GWASs. First of all, let's talk about the hardware requirements. Now, these are intense but relatively modest. You could probably get away doing, with doing a GWAS if you had a quad-core machine with 8 gigabytes of RAM. So, for example, if you have 10,000 participants in your study and a 2 million SNP chip like we have on the H3 array, individual steps in the analysis would take one or two days. And so, if you were very disciplined, you could probably complete a GWAS computationally in a few weeks of, of work. But it's really helpful if you have access to a modest sized computer cluster because this is going to make you much more productive. It's going to enable you to get feedback in an hour or two rather than a day or two. And as we'll see, a GWAS, running a GWAS is not easy and you might need to rerun steps. So I strongly advise you to get access to a computer cluster in order to do this type of analysis, but you can do without it if you really need to. Now, the hardware requirements are relatively modest, but unfortunately, the software requirements are complex and heterogeneous. Now, in an ideal world, the way this would work is we would take our input, the data we get from the genotyping center, and we have some parameters, and we have a program, and we press the go button on the program, and then a few hours later, maybe a few days later, we get the results. Unfortunately, the real world is not anything as close to the ideal world. Many bioinformatics applications share this, but it's particularly true for genome-wide association studies, and it explains why we have uh, a pipeline or workflow that we build for doing GWAS. GWAS cannot be done just by one program. There are several programs that are required in order to do the analysis. And even some of the programs, a program called Plink, for example, that we use at different phases, we need to run at multiple steps. And there are many different software dependencies. We may also need to run our analysis several times with different, different parameters. So, because we have a very complex workflow, 
it makes doing an analysis difficult because it's not just a matter of running one program once, it's a matter of programming, running multiple programs several times. On top of that, there are constraints of good scientific practice that are required in order to run a GWAS. First of all, we need to rerun analyses several times. You'll see I've written re-rerun. That's not a typo. It's deliberately chosen because as we do an analysis, we're going to discover errors in the data. We're going to get better understanding of what parameters are required. And we will have to rerun the analysis or parts of the analysis. Another problem is that it's not just us who will need to run our workflow and be GWAS. Our collaborators might want to do the same thing. And when we submit our papers to journals, often reviewers will want to validate what we've done. So other people need to reproduce the analyses that we have. And finally, we might want to move our analysis from one computer system to another. You might get access to a more powerful computer system. And then you'll want to repeat that analysis on a different system. And you want to make sure you're able to get exactly the same result. OK, so I'm moving now to the next slide. So we're now on page 9. That's entitled Workflow Pipeline. Does everyone see that? We should be on page 9. OK, I will tell you when I move to page pages. So if there is a problem, we'll get feedback. So what we do to solve this problem is to build what's known as a workflow or pipeline. And that's really a way of packaging all the individual steps into one analysis. And the idea is that the user runs the package or the workflow, which automates the individual steps in the computation. Now, this is not meant to be a black box way of running things. The user needs to understand the individual components because understanding which parameters to use at different stages is very important in the scientific validity of the results. But by packaging the analysis so that the user can run the individual steps in a convenient way, we're able to help the uh, doing the analysis and very importantly in reproducing the analysis. Now we'll use two key software technologies to support this. The one is a system called NextFlow. And the other is a technology called containerization. And I'm going to address these two technologies further in the next few slides before I talk about our pipeline in more detail. All right, I'm moving now to page 10. So the most important technology we use is called NextFlow, which is a workflow language and system it was developed by the Comparative Genomics Group at the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona. And they've done a fantastic job, and I want to acknowledge the great work that they've done. And they've been very helpful to us as we've developed these tools for Bionet. Moving to page 11. So, Uh, NextFlow is a, a language and system that allows us to coordinate individual steps of a workflow. It's a specialized, special purpose language with high level support for, for coordination of work. The individual steps in an analysis are done in a standard language like R or Python or C or calling a tool that we'll use like Plink or VCF tools. I'm moving to page 11. So the way we're going to see an analysis 
we can show graphically in a graph like this, where each circle or each node in the graph is one step in the analysis. Each of these tasks is done by a program that we've written in Python or R or C, or calling a standard tool like Plink or VCF Tools or Gemma. And the job of NextFlow is to coordinate how these individual tasks work together. So the output of one task gets given to another task to complete. And that's the job of NextFlow. While the individual tasks are done by the standard tools or programs, NextFlow is responsible for doing the coordination. So, what NextFlow does is to detect dependencies and parallelism in the workflow. We see in the work graph that some parts of the, some tasks depend upon each other. We require the output of one task to be completed before the next task can perform. And NextFlow is responsible for ensuring that a task only starts running once the data is ready for it. On the other hand, some tasks can happen in parallel, and NextFlow can schedule those tasks to happen at the same time, provided you've got multiple processes in your computer. And some tasks may run many times with different parameters or different data, and NextFlow will take care of that. So on to page 13, we see that NextFlow is responsible for detecting dependencies and parallelism in the workflow. It schedules tasks when tasks become ready. And it maps the tasks to the computational resources available. If you're running on a computer that only has one processor, then only one task can execute at a time. But if you're running at a high-performance computing center where you have thousands of processors available to you, then NextFlow can schedule many tasks to happen at the same time. Very important feature of NextFlow is that it can support partial resumption. So if you do an analysis and you make a mistake or you decide you want to change something, when you rerun it, it doesn't have to rerun everything from scratch. It only runs those parts of the analysis that have to be done from uh, that have to be redone as a result of the changes that you've made. Another feature of NextFlow is that it allows you to run your system in different environments. You can say to NextFlow, I want all the processes, all the tasks to run on my local computer. Or you can tell NextFlow, I want you to run on the head node of a cluster and it will schedule all the tasks for us on the cluster or you can tell NextFlow to run everything on a, on a cloud computing system like Amazon EC2. It also supports container technology like Docker and Singularity. I'm moving to page 14. So to install NextFlow is fairly straightforward. I made the decision in this talk not to try, not to do any live demonstrations because it takes quite a lot of time and also you're likely to make uh, typos and make mistakes. There's a downloadable version of my talk and I've got the URL over here. You're welcome to download it and it has more detail than I'm presenting here and it describes in more detail how to install NextFlow. NextFlow requires Java 8. And once you've installed that, you can install NextFlow. And there's a video as well that you can download that shows you how to install NextFlow. So we're not going to look at the step, the individual steps to install NextFlow. It's relatively easy. And you can see the instructions on the handout or in the video that I've created. As an aside, we are making the assumption, both in this talk and all the other talks, that you have a Linux system available, and that you are comfortable at, use, at, at using the Linux command line. If you don't have that, then you need to do a crash course immediately in using the Linux command line. 
and there are several resources available online for that because if you don't have that you're going to struggle not only in this lecture but in many of the other lectures coming up. But I'm moving now to page 15. Now besides Nextflow, there's a lot of other software that's required in order to do a GWAS and in particular to do the GWAS using the tools that we have created. There are two approaches that you might want to take. The first is to install all the individual pieces of software and the libraries yourself. And this has the disadvantages that it requires a fair amount of work to do, but it does give you some flexibility. The other way of installing software is to use Docker or Singularity containers, which package all the dependencies for you. And this requires Docker or Singularity to be on your system. And again, detailed instructions can be found in the handout that I've made available to you. So with Docker and Singularity, it's much easier because there's really only one installation you have to do, which is either Docker or Singularity. The one disadvantage is that you have to have root permission in order to install Docker or Singularity. So if you don't have root permission, you'll need to encourage your friendly system administrator to install Docker or Singularity for you. I'm moving now to page 16. So what is Docker and Singularity? Docker and Singularity are examples of containerization software. I think most people have used virtual machines, systems like VirtualBox or KVM or Parallels. And container containerization is a type of lightweight support for virtual machines. The software container image is a package of an operating system with libraries and tools that are needed for a particular application or applications. And once you have that software container image, you can contain, you can create containers which are runtime systems that can do tasks on your behalf. Each container has its own isolated set of resources, its own file system that can run its own operating system and applications to do something on your behalf. And what we have done in Bionet is to create Docker images with sing and singularity support for all our workflows. And the really good news is that you don't have to be an expert in using Docker or Singularity at all, because Nextflow manages the use of Docker and Singularity for you. All you need to do is to install either Docker or Singularity, and then tell Nextflow that you want to use Docker or Singularity, and Nextflow will handle all the details of using Singularity or Docker for you. Now I've talked about, I'm moving on to page 19, I've talked about Docker and, and Singularity. Why would you use Docker? Why would you use Singularity? They're both perfectly good to use. Uh, we started using Docker and we've now provided with Singularity support. Docker is better known and I think generally there's better support across the board for Docker. But it comes with one problem that is inherent in its design, is that it's not intended for multi-user computers. There are some security issues that make it undesirable to use on a shared computer system. So you're probably not going to find this on your local university cluster. Docker is supported under Linux. It's also supported under Mac OS and Windows 10. With, uh, with certain extensions, so it can be used across a variety of systems. Singularity has better security. It can run on a shared computer system, so you're more likely to find it available on your uh, computer cluster, although there are some more paranoid system administrators who still do not like the use of Singularity, and then you have to install all the software from scratch. Singularity 
is very well supported with Linux. It, you can get it to run on Mac OS or Windows, but there are some extra requirements which make it not as easy to use as with um, with uh, Linux. I see someone typing. I'm just going to take a question. Any questions? No. Okay. Good. Moving on to page 20. So now finally I can talk about what we've done for doing GWAS, the H3A GWAS pipeline. You can find more about our pipeline by going to GitHub, and I've got the URL there. All the software for the pipeline can be found there. And there is extensive documentation um, and some and lots of help available at uh, the GitHub site. And I'm going to give you an overview of what we've done. Now, before jumping into what we've done, I need to tell you a little bit about the type of data that we need to manipulate when we do a genome-wide association study. Um, I see the question from Banjo Rasak. Will this file be shared with us all? Uh, yes, I'm very happy to, to make it available to you all. Um, there is, uh, the slides are available. I did give you the URL right at the beginning. And um, I will type it in now. Sorry, if you give it me a minute, I will give you it now. Slides can be downloaded there. It's not. It's in a in a format that's more suitable for printing out, and it has much more detail than I'm presenting here. And there are also some links to videos. So when you do a GWAS, there are a range of different data types that you might want to 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 analyze. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of them before I talk about what our pipelines do, because it will be useful to understand why we have several pipelines. So the first type of data that you might need to analyze is known as, sorry, the first type of data that you might need to analyze is an image file. And we don't support this yet, but we hope to support it soon. But it's important you understand what it is. This is the rawest data that comes off the genotyping, a genotyping machine. The next step is the call data that describes for each individual what variation they have. And then we can convert that raw data, that call data, into formats that is more suitable for analysis. And we use a format called Plink data. And we get to differentiate between the raw data and then data that's had quality control. And the final type of data that you might have are the results you get from doing the GWAS analysis. So the first type of data is the image data. This is the rawest data that comes off the genotyping machine. And this picture that I'm showing you now on page 22 gives you an example data that you might see. This is just what one SNP looks like. So for each SNP we have on our array, we're going to have image data like this. Each dot is an individual, and the way the image data, an image file works is that when a genotype experiment is done, for each individual, for each SNP, there are, there's a signal that, that indicates what alleles we find at that SNP. So in this picture, each dot represents each individual. You can see that at the bottom right, we have all the individuals who have two A alleles. 
At the top left, we have all the individuals who have two G alleles. And in the middle, we have all the people who have a, an A allele and a G allele. So this is called an image file. Now, I have made it easy for you to see what's happening because I've colored all the dots. You can see the blue and the green and the maroon dots that clearly indicate what's AA, what's AG, and what's GG. But in the real image file, all we've got are the dots. And there's a process called calling the data that determines for each dot in which cluster it belongs. You can see that most of the individuals, it's clear which cluster they fall in, but some of the individuals, like these maroon and green ones, fall in the middle of two clusters, and we have to work out which cluster should they belong to, or are these dots perhaps just errors that need to be eliminated from our study? So this is called this is called calling, and it's a fairly complex process. And we don't support it yet, but we hope to support it soon. So moving on to page 23, the next type of data we have is called data. And you're likely to be get given this by your genotyping center and their programs like Illumina's Genome Studio that will take the image files and produce the core data. And what this does is for every SNP, it determines for each individual which cluster does that individual fall in, and it determines for each individual, for every SNP, what alleles that individual has. Now, there are different formats that are available for the core data. Uh, this will be a topic of a later lecture. So there's top-bottom format, there's forward-reverse format. They're the most, uh, most likely ones you have. And it's very important to know what format you have. But that's going to be a topic of another lecture. So these formats are, are, are good because they tell us for every individual exactly what they have for every SNP. But it's a very verbose format. And there aren't any tools that directly manipulate this format data. So we have provided scripts in our workflow that converts from call data into Plink data, and I'm now on page 24. So Plink data is the most commonly used data for genome-wide association studies. Not only the tool called Plink uses it, but other tools also use Plink. When you store your data in Plink format, and we use a binary Plink format, for particular experiment, data is going to be found in three files. There will be a FAM file that describes who the people in your study are. It will give you the IDs of the individuals, who their parents are, the sex of the individuals, and some phenotype data as well. Then there will be a BIM file that describes for an index, which is essentially an index of the SNPs in your experiment. It describes each SNP, it tells you which chromosome they're on, where on the chromosome it's found, and the two possible alleles for that particular SNP. And then there's the bed file that describes, in a relatively compact way, for each person, for each SNP, what the alleles are. So in a realistic example, you're likely to find that your bed file is several gigabytes in size. Your BIM file might be several hundred megabytes in file in size, and your FAM file might be several K in size. Then once you've done, got your data in the Plink format, you'll want to analyze it. And we've now got three workflows that you might find useful. The first is called topbottom.nf, and this converts from Illumina top bottom format or forward reverse format into Plink format. Then there's a workflow called plinkqc.nf that takes as input Plink data and as output Plink data and does quality control. So it goes from the raw Plink data into quality control Plink data. 
And then the third workflow is the plink gwas.nf that does a basic association study itself. Any questions at this point before I move on? Okay, I'm moving on now to page 26. So, I've told you how to install Nextflow, and you'll also find a description in the notes how to install Docker or, or Singularity, or if you want to install each of the individual software, that's in detail in the notes. The next step is how do you install the workflow? And there are two approaches to installing the workflow, the software that we have created. The first is you can use Nextflow itself to install our workflow. And that's what I'm going to present in this lecture. If you want to do more advanced work, then you can use a system called Git for doing that. And if you do that, you'll be able to modify our workflow to specialize it for your, your own work. Um, I see Wisdom has asked if, one, if you can do work on VCF files. Our tools don't allow direct support of VCF. But Plink has a facility for converting from VCF into Plink. So if your data is already in VCF, you can run Plink to convert from VCF into Plink format. And then you can use our uh, Plink QC and our Plink GWAS workflows. So, what I'm showing you now is what I would recommend the way you start, start using our workflow. Let's look at page 27. So to install our workflows, it's very easy. You go to the command line and you type nextflow pull h3a bionet slash h3a gwas. And it'll take about a minute or two and then our workflow, so all our workflow software gets installed on your computer and you can then start using our workflows. Once it's installed, you can start running it. Look at page 28. You can run workflows as follows. If you wanted to run the top bottom workflow, you'll say next flow run H3A Bionet, H3A GWAS, top bottom dot NF, as well as some parameters that I'll explain later on. If you want to do QC, you'll say next flow run H3A Bionet, H3A GWAS, plink QC dot NF, and some parameters. And if you want to do GWAS, you'll say next flow run H3A Bionet, H3A GWAS, Plink gwas.nf with the appropriate parameters. I see I've been asked, is there documentation for each workflow? Yes, we've developed uh, quite extensive documentation for these three, and you can find them in the, the uh, documentation on the GitHub site that you'll find the URL earlier on in the talk. And in the handout that I made available, there's also some information. Yes, all of these commands are commands that you would type at the Linux command line. The GitHub URL is on the, in, in the PDF. Um, and Samir, can I ask you perhaps just to type in the URL while I continue talking? Thanks. So Samir will type in the URL for the, uh, the, the GitHub site. Thanks, Samir. Then you will, from time to time, time to time, want to update the next flow, uh, our workflow. Uh, when we make changes to next flow, if we discover there's a bug or we add a feature, the next time you run our workflow, you're going to get a message, it's a warning message rather than an error, that says something like, "Note: your local project version looks outdated. A different revision is available in the remote repository." And you can then update the workflow by just rerunning Nextflow pull that will bring the updated version of the, of the, um, of the workflow into your, 
into your workspace. Okay. Now, in order to make the workflows run, a crucial concept is that of a configuration file. Nextflow, all Nextflow workflows are controlled by configuration files. You can have several configuration files for a particular run, but we would recommend that you have two configuration files for each run. First, you use the default configuration file that we provide, nextflow.config file. Then, in addition, you have a smaller configuration file that redefines just those things that you need. So here you'll specify the input files that you require, where you want the output to be, and those parameters that you want changed that are different to the default. This way, you can use the standard configuration file, which is quite big, and then have a small config file that just describes the differences to the standard config file. And I'm going to give you an example of what a small, smaller config file would look like. So moving on to page 31. Once you've got your config file, let's suppose I put it in a file called b.config, I can run my workflow like this. Next flow run h3o bionet slash h3o gwas slash plink qc.nf and then you specify the config by saying minus c b.config. And what this will do is run our workflow with the default nextflow.config file that we've provided, plus the specified config file that you've just added. Any questions? But now I'm not going to risk doing a live demonstration of a config file, uh, a, a live demonstration of running a, a workflow now, because that's uh, too high risk and we don't have enough time. But you will see in the handout that I made a video that shows how it runs. And instead, I'm just going to show you some screenshots of how it works. So to answer Mamadou's question, in the b.config file, you'll specify your particular parameters, those things that you want to be different to the standard default parameters, like the, where the input data comes from, where the output data should go, and any parameters that you want to be different. And I'll give you an example now. So I'm going to show, as uh, because we don't have time in the talk we presenting now to go through all the workflows. I'm only going to choose the plinqc.nf, which is our main workflow, um, and illustrate how it works. So the details of the QC process you'll learn more about in subsequent lectures. And in the documentation on GitHub, we go through it in more detail. But essentially what happens is it will remove any duplicate SNPs. It will remove SNPs and individuals that are of poor quality, for example, where there's high missingness, or they're, they're out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or there's very low minor allele frequency. We'll remove outliers based on sample heterozygosity. We'll remove uh, individuals who might be related to each other, and we'll do, te we'll do tests of differential missingness. And it will also produce a very comprehensive report of the QC process, and I will try to present that uh, to you um, later, later, um, uh, later on, I'll give you some examples of a uh, QC um, process. Uh, so I see uh, Mazin uh, has asked a question about relatedness. Uh, yes, it's very important to be aware of relatedness, not only in the SNPs, but in the individuals in your sample. So I'm not going to talk uh, about the theory of how to do a GWAS, because that's going to be covered in more detail later on. So how you should worry, when and how you should worry about relatedness, I'm going 
someone else will cover in a later talk. Uh, what I'm presenting to you in this talk is how you would specify that for our workflow. So a very good question, but you'll have to be patient for uh, a subsequent talk. Okay. Thanks, Samir. So I'm now moving on to page uh, 33. So the main things you're going to have in the config file will be you'll specify the input directory and the file that you want. You'll have specify the output directory and the name of the output file you want. Then we have several features that allow you to do batch analysis. And we strongly recommend that you do batch analysis because this is a common cause of error in, in, in uh, many GWAS studies. And you'll also specify quality control cutoffs. In addition, you'll need a phenotype file that describes the individuals in your study. For example, you will have uh, what sex the individuals are, and you'll describe some of the key phenotypes that, uh, that you have in your particular study. So let's make an example. On page 34 of the slides, we have uh, an example. This is what a config file would look like. So here we just specify the parameters. In this example, I say the input directory is a directory called sample. The data file, the input data file, is called sample A. Remember, we have Plink data as input, so there should be three files in this case, sample a.bed, sample a.bim, and sample a.fan. Output, that is the name of the output file, and again, it will produce a bed, bim, and fan file. What directory you want the output to go to. We will have a file that contains the case control information and it must have the headers and case control col will be the label of the column where the case control information can be found. Then we have a file called a batch file and a phenotype file that we use for doing batch analysis. So we have to name the batch and the phenotype file. It can be the same file, but there will be different columns, and we specify in the batch call and the phenotype call the names of those columns. So in this example that I've presented, we sent our genotyping in different batches to the genotyping center, and so we want to make sure that there aren't differences between the different batches that we sent. And we recruited individuals from different sites. And we want to drill down to see how the, uh, whether the differences between the different sites where we did the recruiting. In your study, you may have different columns you want to use. So Oscar's asked a very important question. Ask, are QC cutoffs data set and population specific? Absolutely. Absolutely population and project specific. But I'm going to delay this to the person who's presenting quality, the quality control lecture to answer this. So the way, what I'm telling you is if you want to specify the pi hat, which is about relatedness, you do that by specifying params.pi hat. If you want to specify the minor allele frequency cutoff, you do that by specifying maf. And the lecturer who's going to present quality control will tell you how and why to choose 0 0.18 or 0 .01, 0 0.12 or 0 0.05, depending upon your particular project. Point is, once you know, once you've learned from subsequent lectures how to set those QC cutoffs, you specify that in this configuration file. And once you've done that, you can then run the analysis. So I've put my config file in a configuration file called sc.config, and then I can run my analysis by saying next flow run h3a bionet h3a gwas minus c 
sc.config, flink, qc.nf, and the, the, the uh, workflow runs and does the analysis. And you get to see something that looks like this. It shows the um, different steps in the in the analysis. Uh, I've cut off some, there are a number of others, just to fit all on one page. And these are the individual step steps in the QC analysis that happen. And depending on the size of your data and your computer, the computers that you've got available, this will take um, a few minutes or a few hours or maybe tens of hours to do the QC. And once it's completed, you'll get a QC uh, report. And I'm going to take you through the QC report in a few minutes, which is very useful because it will help explain your, your uh your analysis. So moving on to page uh, 37, on the previous slide I assumed that all the tools had already been installed on the system. But what I want to show you is that if you don't have all the tools installed on the system and you've got Singularity, and you've got Docker, you can run the analysis without installing all the complex software by running exactly the same command, except adding at the end, minus profile Docker. And the system will then run exactly the same analysis, give you the same results, but it will use the Docker images that we have created for you. The only word of warning on this is that the first time you do this, there may be very long delays as the Docker images are fetched from their, their repositories. So it might take you 10 or even 20 minutes the first uh, extra the first time you run it. But once you've downloaded the images once, subsequent runs aren't going to take you any longer than running them in the normal way. If you've got a cluster, then the way you'll run the workflow is you'll log into the head node of the cluster and you'll run the next flow workflow on the head node of the cluster and the scheduler of the cluster will then schedule the individual components to the worker nodes and next flow will do that on your behalf and so you run next flow on the head node next flow will sub submit the jobs to the job queue when processes are ready And the only difference is exactly the same command, except you add minus profile PBS at the end. And if you want to run it with Docker, you would say minus profile PBS Docker. So it's very easy to change, to run exactly the same workflow in different computing environments just by changing your, your uh, profile. Any questions? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to try to do now is um, I want to try to share my screen um, so that I can show you the report. Uh, can you see? See my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Can you see my screen? Can someone talk? Okay, thank you. So this is what a sample report looks like. Uh, you'll see there's an introduction that describes the raw data that came into the QC approach. And it describes the QC that happens in different phases. 
You get told about the missingness in your input data. You get told, please could you mute your microphone? You get told about the minor allele frequency spectrum of the raw data. You get told about the missingness at the individual level. You get told about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium distribution. You get QQ plots. Then there's a, a second phase of QC that's done, which is the main phase. And uh, you get told about problems, if there's missingness in the data, if you have individuals where the sex genotype mismatches with what you said in the manifest, that might probably an indication that you've had a sample mishandling issue. And there's a very detailed batch analysis that's done as well. You get told about related individuals. Uh, there's a principal component analysis at the batch level and at the site level. There's um, a check on heterozygosity, um, what the minor allele frequency spectrum is at the end of your QC data. Uh, you get told about the differences between cases and controls. So you can pick up potential problems. And uh, at the end, you get told what the final result is. In, in our case, we had um, 1, 1 million SNPs and 9,000 participants left and where the output can be found with, together with the MD5 sums of the output, which allows us to um, track that we don't get version skews between the data. In addition, the configuration files are all put in the appendix. So if we want to reproduce this particular analysis, we can do so. We know exactly what the parameters were that we used for the study. Um, any questions? Any questions? Okay. Okay. I'm now going to try and switch this off. Um, and can we go back to the presentation, Sumia? Um, sorry, Pabalo or Samir, can you upload the presentation? Thanks very much. Okay, so I'm not don't have much longer. It's taken a bit longer than I expected. I'm sorry. Um, the we're now back on page forty-two. So I want to show you very briefly the association workflow. Uh, it works very similar. And now the work the association workflow is quite experiment dependent. And this is something that you're likely to change uh, to make it different to what we've done so far. Uh, because this will depend upon your data, your population structure, what your covariates are, the questions you want to ask. And a uh, very similar thing, you specify the a configuration file that describes where the input comes and where the output goes. You'll specify the covariates you want to use. You'll specify the, the uh, phenotypes you want to test. So the covariates and the phenotype are given as comma-separated lists of, of uh, factors, um, as well as some other parameters. So here I'm saying I want to use Gemma, and I want to do a linear regression on the data. And then I will run the study. Similar way, I'll say next flow run. I specify the workflow. I specify the config file, and the results then become available. And I can present that in, show you what it looks like. Um, sorry. And So I'm hoping you can all see my, my, my screen. So this is what a, uh, the report from the association study looks like, where we've done the association test on a number of different phenotypes. We first get given a 
a histogram of the different distributions of the phenotypes so we can make sure we've done the appropriate transformation. Then we get given the results. So I've asked to do Gemma and linear regression on a number of different, uh, different phenotypes. So we get a Manhattan plot that shows the analysis as well as which SNPs have come out as significant. We get QQ plots. And for each of the phenotypes we asked about, we get the results, we get a Manhattan plot, we get a QQ plot, and then we do the same thing for the linear regression um, as well. Okay. And if we can go back to, uh, sorry, Papalo, can we, can I ask you to put back, thank you very much. So that's what the, the association testing workflow provides. Um, so that's the, the theory. Of course, in practice, some things will go wrong. And uh, when you run the workflow, you might find the workflow crashes because it could be there's a bug in our workflow, or you could have done something stupid as well. And in the detailed handout that I've given you, I've I give you some hints on how to navigate your way around the errors that might, might appear. If you need some help, there are two ways in which you can do, do that. If you go to H3A Bionet Help Desk, you'll see there's an option there for getting help on the pipeline usage, so you're welcome to put a ticket over there, or if you've got a GitHub account, you can go to the GitHub site and you can open up a ticket under Issues. And then just to acknowledge the work on this um, and the funding, uh, primary funding from uh, NIH through for Bionet, as well as the Awigen project, which has contributed to this. And it's been a big team effort of people who have contributed to this project. I probably left out some names, and I apologize to anyone whose names I've left out. Okay, are there any questions? So, I don't know if you can read um, in the comments the questions there. Someone just asked, if I have all the dependencies installed in my system, so no need to install Docker, right? Absolutely. No need to install Docker. And you'll find in the handouts, I've given you instructions on how to implement the different dependencies. Ah, oh, sorry, I've been... Uh, so, sorry, I missed, I missed all the questions. I must apologize. Um, I had the wrong window open. Um, so, perhaps I could start, start the, quest, the questions. Um, Zin asks, can I use a different way to compute by the Plink file? I'm not sure I understand that question. Perhaps you could elaborate on this. Mamadou's question I've answered. Absolutely, you don't have to use Docker or Singularity. You can install the individual components. And if you've got a reasonable system administration skills, it shouldn't take you too long to, to do that. Um, Mazin asked about doing the QQ analysis. And again, Mazin, I'm going to leave that to the lecturer who does the QC uh, in a subsequent lecture. Uh, what I've shown you today is how you specify the QC the QC parameters, you'll learn in a subsequent lecture what those parameters should be and how to interpret them. Um, um, uh, Oscar asks, can we get the final QC results in a portable format, i.e. not PDFs, um, such as Excel or te text file? So all the results are available as CSV or text files. Uh, the PDF report is there just to help you uh, navigate your way through the results because when you do the analysis it generates lots of, of files whether you're doing QC or whether you're doing the association study there are lots of files that gets that get produced and to try to navigate your way around 
which file is which sometimes can be a challenge. So the, the PDF file is meant just to help you as the human understand which file is which and how to interpret it. Um, then there's a question about Windows 10. Yanni, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer that question. We're supporting Linux. We're not supporting Windows. If you really have to use Windows 10, I'm afraid you're on your own. You probably can get it to work using Singularity and, uh, and maybe Docker, but um, we really strongly encourage you to, to use Linux. Uh, next question. Yeah, I think I've answered all the questions. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no further questions. Um, if there are no further questions, I'd just like on behalf okay, of everyone at Asia so Binance and all the attendees to thank you, Professor Hazelhead, for an excellent, excellent lecture on how to get your computational environment set up to run the HU by network flows and taking us through the HU by network flow. So thank you, Scott. Thanks, Samir. Uh, it was a pleasure. Samira, I keep seeing you raising your hand. Is there anything you'd like to ask or type in? Okay, if there are no further questions, then um, I think we can conclude today. I'm going to close the meeting room and I'm going to set a URL, so please complete the registration form. And we'll see you in the lecture on Wednesday on G an overview of GWAS study designs and association studies. So thank you.